Pseudocode is a way of planning out computer code or algorithms. To start off with, we're going to look at the concepts of variables, input and print. When you look at pseudocode, you should read down the page as you would normally do when reading a book. The first line here is a statement which says n arrow 0. What that means is the value 0 is being assigned or given or put into a variable called n. So over here I've got n and after this first line here n will have the value of 0. Then we'll move to the next line. The next line says input m. Input means sit and wait for the user to type something in. In this case we're going to store whatever is typed in into the variable m. So let's assume that somebody typed in the value 3. So after these two lines the variables n and m have the values 0 and 3. The next line is print. This will print two numbers on the screen depending on what n and m are. So what will happen is that down here on the screen we'll end up with 0 and 3. The next line says print n plus m. So as you can probably imagine, n and m are added together, in this case 0 and 3, and we get the answer 3. The last line doesn't have any variables but has quotation marks. This means the literal string, hello world, will be printed to the screen as it's written. So after all these lines of code have occurred, the screen will have this output. So you can see I've inserted a new line, n arrow 4. Let's see what happens to the code. The first line will do the same as before, and n will be given the value 0. The next line will do is again the same thing, and someone will type in a number. Let's assume this time they typed in the number 5. Print n and m will print to the screen, and we will get 0 and 5 on the screen. The next line says n is assigned the value of 4. So that means n now has the number 4 in it. Now it's important to realise this value of 0 no longer exists anymore. n can only store one number at a time. So the value for n is only the last number in this column. All other values have disappeared. Now when we get to this statement here, print n plus m, this time instead of getting 5, we're going to get 9 because of the current values of n and m. This last statement will again print hello world. If you change the value of n during the execution of the code, then only the latest value is used. When writing pseudocode, we often don't use single letters for variable names. For example, in this code I'm using num instead of n and mist instead of m. The code will work exactly the same way. So why bother? The reason is it makes the code more easy to understand, especially if you haven't looked at it for a while. The next statement we're going to look at is if, then, and else. This allows code to do something different depending on what has happened before. So let's have a look at this code here. Print, type a whole number, will of course print the literal string, type a whole number to the screen. The next statement, input value, will stop and wait for us to type something in. Let's suppose the person using the program typed in the number 5. Now we come to the if statement. You'll notice that if has some important words. There's this line here that says if and then. There's this line here that says else. And this line that says end if. This statement in here is a Boolean statement. It's either true or false. If this statement is true, this line of code will run. If it's not true, this line of code will run. So let's see what happens with our number 5. So the value is actually less than 10. So this statement will run, and your number was less than 10, will end up on the screen. It's important to realise that this part of the code will not run. Only one of these two sections can run. It's either true or false. So for a value of 5, only this line will run. Let's assume we're running the program again. This time somebody typed in 15, 
and so value now has 15 in it. When we look at the if statement, this is no longer true because value is not less than 10. So the code will jump down to this line and only print that. So you can see that the screen is different this time because the value of 15 is actually not less than 10. Now I'm going to look at something that's called a nested if. When you nest an if, you include it inside another if statement. So if you look at this code, what's different is this section here has replaced one line of code. This whole section will be executed if the Boolean operation here is false. So if the value is not less than 10, all of this will execute. So let's assume that when the program ran, the number typed in by the user was 5. This statement would be true, and so this would be printed to the screen. Because value is less than 10, none of this second part here will execute because that's what happens if it's false. So the screen will look like this. Let's assume now that we actually run the program and we input the value 15. This line here will be false, so this line is ignored. So the program jumps down to here, which is all the code that will run because value is not less than 10. So the first thing that happens is there's another if. So the program will check to see if the value is less than 20. And of course it is because it's 15. So this time we will print this to the screen. So your screen will look like this. So because value is less than 20, this line here will not run. So let's now input a value of 30. This will not be true, so the program will jump down to here. This will not be true, so the program will jump down to here, and only that line will run. So this time, we will get this printed to the screen. Nested ifs can be very useful for looking at multiple intervals. The next statement we're going to look at is called while. Here it is here. You notice it's similar to if in that there is a Boolean expression after it. What makes while different is it will keep executing these two lines of code until this is not true. So let's have a look at this program in action. First of all, it's going to print squares less than 10 to the screen. Then the value of 1 will be stored in x. Next we get to the while statement. Because 1 squared is less than 10, this statement is true, so both of these will run. We will get 1 squared printed to the screen, which is obviously 1, and then the value of x will be increased by 1. The way to interpret this line of code is that 1 is added to x, and then that value is then stored in x. So over here I've got the previous value and the current value. Remember, only the current value is active. All previous values are now deleted. When we finish those two lines, we come to the end, which means we go back up to the top again and repeat the same process. Now this time, because x is now worth 2, 2 squared is 4, still less than 10, so we're going to print x squared. And so what will be on the screen will be 4. Then we add one more to x again, and so the after this line, the current value of x is 3. When we get to the end, we jump back up to the top again and check to see if this is true still. So now that x is 3, 3 squared is still less than 10. So this time we're going to print 3 squared. So we print 3 squared, and then we add 1 onto x again. So now x is worth 4. When we jump back up to here and test to see if 4 squared is less than 10, we get false. So that means the code between the while and the end while is ignored, and the program will continue on from the bottom. Now let's look at a couple of common mistakes that people make. In this first one, you'll notice that I've actually got the lines in between the while and the end while reversed. What that means is that when we get to the print, it will be printing the next value of x squared. So we would miss this value of 1 down here, and it wouldn't be printed. So by having the print first, we're actually printing the value of x which made this true rather than the next value. Another common mistake is to actually not have this line at all. So if I deleted this, we now have what's called an endless loop. So what will happen is x will be worth 1, which is and 1 squared is less than 10, so it'll print 1 squared, which is 1. 
then it will come back up to here and notice that 1 squared is less than 10, and again print 1 squared, which is 1. What we're going to end up with is an endless loop with 1 just being printed over and over again. If you've ever had your computer freeze on you, here's a good example of why that could happen. A for loop is another way to repeat lines of code. Let's have a look at this example. First of all, we're going to print to the screen, and we're going to print first five squares. Then we start the for loop. You notice that the for loop has a variable in it, in this case called i, and i stores a value, and it starts off with the number one. It will then execute this line of code, and we will get one squared, which is obviously one. Then it will get to the end of the for loop and jump back up to the top again, and i will be changed to two. Because i is now two, it will then print two squared. I'm guessing you can see what happens after that. So then we'll get three squared, four squared, and then five squared. Once the value of i gets to five, then the loop will end. The advantage of a for loop is you know in advance how many loops through the code will occur, whereas a while loop depends on the initial condition being true. So now we're going to look at nested for loops. That just means that you've got one for loop starting here and ending here, and another one inside it. Let's see how that works. In this code, we're looking at storing the number zero in the variable sum. Then we start the first loop. I will be made one, and inside that we proceed to the next loop, where J is made one. Inside the J loop, it says to print I and J. So we get one and one. The next statement says to take sum and add I and J to it. So adding one plus one plus zero obviously makes two. We get to the end of this loop and we jump back up to here again because we haven't finished the J loop yet and J is incremented to two. We then print I and J and we get one and two. We then change the value of sum again so sum will become 1 plus 2 plus 2, which will become 5. And we've finished this loop, and we go back up to the top again, and j becomes 3. We print i and j, and then we do this addition again for sum. And so sum becomes 1 plus 3 plus 5. Once we get to there, we've actually finished doing the three loops through the j4 loop. We come down to the end here, and go back up to the top of the i loop to now make i increment. So i is now worth 2. Now that i is worth 2, we come back here again and we start the j loop again. So j starts again from 1. We print i and j. Then we change sum by adding 2 plus 1 plus 9, which is 12. And that means we've finished that loop for j worth 1. And we come back up here again and j becomes 2. Now that j is 2, when we print i and j, we get 2 and 2. Then we again do the alteration to the value of sum. This time we're adding 2 plus 2 plus 12. Again, we come back up here because j hasn't finished going through its loop yet, and j will be made 3. We print i and j, and we get 2 and 3. And then we again alter sum. So this time we've got 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 16 is 21. Now that we've been through this three times, we drop down to the bottom here and continue with i changing to 3. So i is now worth 3. This will be the last go through this i loop. j again starts off at 1, because j has got to start again. Sum will be altered by adding these three numbers again. This time we've got 3 plus 1 is 4, so we get 25. So I think you can see what's going on here. Every time i goes through its loop, j has to go through its loop three times. The last thing we're going to look at in this video is the idea of a function. A function is some code that you would like to use later. So here we can see the keyword define. When you see the word define, the next thing is the name of the function, and then in brackets, some information that needs to be passed to the function when you're using it. So you'll notice later on, I've written factorial 2. That means that 2 will come, and n will be worth 2, 
when I call it here. So when that function is run here or called here, it'll come back up here with the number two. This bit of code is basically ignored until it's called. So the very first thing that happens is this line here, which is print factorials of primes less than 10. So when this line is called, we end up with factorials of prime less than 10 on the screen. The next line that's encountered is another print statement. It says print two, but also print whatever factorial is. So on the screen here, we're going to get two plus the answer to factorial of two, which will be two, but we'll check that. Let's go up and see what happens to factorial when the number two is sent. So as we come up here, we can see that the first thing that happens is product is given the number one. So product is now worth one. So now we have a for loop, which is going to repeat n times, starting with i worth one and going up to whatever n is. Now in this case, because we've called it from down here, n will be two. So let's put two in there. So n is two. So when this loop starts, i will be made one. And so we're going through our loop the first time. Product is given a new value of product times i. So one times one will be one and product will be worth one. We get to the end of the for loop, come back up to the top again and increment i. So i becomes two. And the next thing we do is we take product times i and store it in product. So this time we've got one times two. So product will now become two. When we get down to the end of the loop, we've actually been through the loop two times, which is what n is. So the loop stops and we return product. Now what that means is the value of product comes back to factorial where it was called. And so it's going to print whatever factorial calculated in this case two. So that's how this second two gets there. When we get to the next line, it says print three and factorial three. So again, we're going to get three and then the code will jump up to here and do factorial three. So product will be become one. We're going to loop from i equals one to three because we sent three to n. So this is the first time through the loop and product will be changed to product multiplied by i. So one times one, so product will be one. Then we go through the loop again and this time i is two. So the product will be equal to product times i. So one times two is two. So product is now two. Then we come back up here again and we've got to go through one more time because we haven't got to i equals three yet. So i is incremented to three. And product will be product times i. So two times three is six. This is the third time through the loop. So we stop and now we return product, which is worth six. Print will print the result of factorial, which was six. So factorial returns six, so that gets printed. I won't go through these two lines because it's the same thing. It's just gonna take longer, but it's the same procedure. So obviously we'll get five and factorial five, which is 120, and seven and factorial seven, which is 5,040. So this has demonstrated how using a function can save writing more code. The other advantage is, if I wanted to change factorial, instead of having to change it four times for each of these, I only have to change it once. I hope you found this video helpful and good luck with your studies of pseudocode.